We live life with lots of maps in our heads, maps to the physical world, maps to human society, maps to our family, our work, maps to our place in the larger scheme of the universe. And a lot of our maps have missing pieces. They're like puzzles that we've pieced together. Some of these maps we've gotten from other people. They'll give us a sketch with some big gaping holes. And there are other maps that we put together ourselves as we find one piece that fits to another piece. Seems to make sense. And all these maps serve a purpose. Now, sometimes we're given a map that doesn't serve our purposes at all. It serves the purposes of the people who gave the map. And some of the maps we've put together ourselves, after a while we realize that it's not useful anymore. It's like a map to a treasure that when we found the treasure we realized it wasn't a treasure at all. It was just pits of glass and shiny things, but nothing really of any value. So we put those maps aside. Maybe we put them up on the wall to look back and say, well, that's how I used to believe things. But thank goodness I don't believe those things anymore. And even when those maps still have missing pieces, in other words, questions we have about our place in the world, our place in work, and whatever, if it's a map that we've no longer shown any interest in, we're not interested in finding the missing pieces. It doesn't matter anymore because we have other maps that we're still trying to put together. Those are the more important ones. So when we come to the Dhamma, it's as if the Buddha gives us a map, a map to a world in which the end of suffering is possible. In some cases, the map comes with the pieces put together, and there seem to be, however, some other pieces that are missing. Or there are pieces in a pile there on the table, and we're trying to figure out where the pieces fit in. But all too often we find a piece, and it reminds us of another map that we have in our minds. And if we're not really clear about the Buddha's map, we'll find some of the pieces from his map, but we think that they're actually pieces that fit into some of the maps we already have. An example is the teaching on not-self. It seems to fit in the maps that ask questions like, who am I? Do I have a self? Do I have anything of permanent value here or lasting value here? Am I uh, actually an agent or powers operating through me? Do I really exist? Do I don't exist? Those may be some missing pieces in some of our pre-existing maps. Or there's the other map where the issues of ego come up. Is the ego a good thing? Is the ego a bad thing? And it seems to be saying, in the case of the first map, there is no self. There's nobody there. In the case of the second one, it seems to be saying the ego is a bad thing. You shouldn't have an ego. And so we can jam the piece in, even though it doesn't quite fit. And then we take that map and we look at the remainder of the Buddhist map that we have. And the two maps don't seem to fit together. Because the Buddha talks about action, the importance of karma. And the question is, well, if there is no self, who's doing the karma? Who's going to receive the karma? But it talks about rebirth. Well, who's going to get reborn? And he talks about a path of action that you have to follow. Well, if your ego is a bad thing, how are you going to follow it? Because you need to have some self-confidence if you're going to follow anything, if you're going to be able to manage this path. All this confusion comes from the fact that we're trying to fit his anatta piece into 
maps where it doesn't belong. So what we need to do is get a clear sense of what his map is and see how that piece fits in. Because he insists that in his map, the question or the hole in the map that would say is the question asking, what is my identity? Who am I? Do I exist? Do I not exist? That's not a missing piece in his map. In other words, that's not the question that the Anatta teaching was meant to answer. Same about the question about the ego, whether the ego is good or bad. Anatta was not meant to answer that question either. So what questions was it meant to answer? I think about the Buddhist statement about how two of his teachings are categorical, in other words, true across the board, beneficial across the board. One is that skillful actions should be developed and unskillful ones should be abandoned. And the other one is basically a subtler working out of that principle, which is the Four Noble Truths. The truth of suffering, which is clinging. The truth of the origination of suffering, which is craving. The truth of the cessation of suffering, which is dispassion and dispassion for and the cessation of that craving. And then there's the truth of the path practice that leads to the cessation of suffering, which is the Noble Eightfold Path. Now, in that sense, the, the craving is the unskillful action that should be abandoned, and the Noble Eightfold Path is the skillful action that should be developed. And then based on that, the question that is the starting point for wisdom is, what is skillful? What is unskillful? And then the Buddha further refines that, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. And what when I do it will lead to my long-term harm and suffering. Those are the questions that the Anatta teaching is meant to answer. Because the Buddha looks at our sense of self, and not so much as what it is, but as an action, it's something we do. We have a perception of self, an assumption of self. And the question then becomes, when is that a skillful action and when is it an unskillful action? And there are stages in the path when it is skillful. There are versions of yourself that are skillful. There's the self that the Buddha says as a governing principle. When you've been practicing for a while, and you start getting discouraged, and you think of giving up, and he has you reflect. I came to this path because I wanted to put an end to suffering. That's what this map is all about. Now that I'm thinking of giving up, do I not care about the end of suffering? I came because I loved myself. Do I not love myself? That's a skillful sense of self. There's also a skillful use for conceit, is where your ego comes in, where you think about how other people have found awakening. They're human beings. I'm a human being. If they can do it, why can't I? So you've got the sense of self who will enjoy the results of the path. You've got the sense of self that feels competent to do the path. Those are some of our most basic senses of self, regardless of what our desire is. In this case, the desire is a good one. It's one to be encouraged. We want the end of suffering. There's a third sense of self, which you might recall the reflective self, which is when you have a desire and you start acting on that desire, and then you act actually look at what you're doing to see how well it's working. That's the self that steps back from other senses of self, steps back from other activities. And that, too, is to be encouraged on the path. You need that, as the Buddha said. The drama comes from being committed to the path and then reflecting on what you're doing. And then based on that reflection, you make further refinements. So these senses of self are important. They're necessary for the path. So it's perfectly okay to have a sense of self as you get started. The Buddha expresses this when he's talking to his son. As he told his son, before you act, ask yourself, this action that I plan to do, will it lead to harm to myself or to anyone else? 
if you foresee any harm, you don't do it. While you're doing it, you ask yourself, this action that I am doing, is it leading to harm for myself or anyone else? If so, stop. If not, continue. And then when you're done, ask yourself, this action that I did, did it lead to harm? If it did, you make up your mind not to repeat the action. Go talk it over with someone who you trust to get some idea of how you can avoid that mistake in the future. If you didn't harm anybody, then you take joy in that fact that you're progressing in the path, and then you continue practicing, growing in the path. There's an I in there. This action that I did, am planning to do, I am doing, I did. You're taking responsibility for your actions, again, which is a necessary part of the path. So there are cases where the sense of self is a skillful thing, a sense of a healthy ego, competent. You know that you're going to benefit from these actions. You take care in your actions because you realize your actions are important. That kind of ego is a good ego. Simply that as the path gets more and more refined, you learn on the one hand to disidentify with any senses of self that would pull you off the path. For example, with the practice of virtue, there are times when you realize that by following the precepts it might be bad for your health. You might have to make some sacrifices there, or your wealth. Or if your relatives come and ask you to lie, you have to say no. And that's when you have to realize the sense of self that would hold on to the health or the wealth or the relatives at that point is unhealthy. That sense of self you've got to drop. The same with your meditation. There may be lots of yous in there that want to do something else besides meditate. You have to say no to them. That kind of sense of self is something you have to drop. And there will come a point where the only thing you're holding on to is the path. You have to remember in the context of the Four Noble Truths, the path is to be developed. But the path is fabricated. If you're going to get, let go of all fabrications, you're going to have to let go of the path, too. And this is where the teaching on not-self really moves in. You look, say, at your concentration, and you realize it's made out of a form. There's a feeling of pleasure. The form is the form of the breath, the form of the body as you're aware of the whole body. The feeling is the feeling of pleasure, perception. Is the perception holds you with the breath, that mental image that holds you with the breath. Fabrication, your directed thought and evaluation, as you adjust the mind to fit with the breath and then keep it there. And then consciousness, which is aware of all these things. You have to see that these things, too, once you've mastered the concentration, are stressful and inconstant. And they're based on craving. So you have to let go of the craving even for the co concentration, even for your discernment. You have to let go of that craving, too. That's when you apply not-self as a perception all around. But again, as the Buddha said, you do this for your long-term welfare and happiness. Because the happiness that comes, the cessation of suffering that comes when you totally let go like that, is the ultimate happiness totally free from suffering. So that's where the not-self teaching fits in, in the areas where you have to let go of things that would pull you away from the path, and ultimately when you have to let go of the path. So what is a not-self teaching? Is it not a no-self teaching or an ego-is-bad teaching? Because the question of whether there is or is not a self, the Buddha said, is just a thicket of views that would pull you away from the path. It would foster the kinds of craving that would keep you off the path. To learn how to use this 
piece of the puzzle in the right puzzle in the right place. It all makes sense. And it not only makes sense, it's really useful and beneficial to teach that there is no self is not beneficial at all. Because you might start thinking, well, who cares? Or if I do anything unskillful, who's going to be receiving the results of that unskillful action if there's nobody there? The ego is bad. The ego is good. Those teachings have their pitfalls as well. But when you learn to see the sense of self as something that you do, and there are skillful ways of doing it and unskillful ways of doing it, then the question simply becomes then, okay, which kinds of ways are skillful, which ways are unskillful? There may still be a missing set of pieces in your puzzle, but at least you've got the right puzzle. and have a good idea of what kind of pieces would actually fit. So you can use that puzzle, the map portrayed in the puzzle, for its purpose, which is to see how you can get to the end of suffering, that it is something that's possible, and this is how you do it.